So what do you then do in the cases where your religious belief and secular society don't match up and you're taking into account what you just said about not trying to legislate everything? So I think gay marriage is probably the best example of this. Something that is now legal in America that is, a, a, would you say it's against the, the biblical teachings? Is that a fair way to? Uh, yeah, that's a fair way to characterize it. That's a fair, it. fair way to characterize it. So how do you deal with something like that? Well, you have to go case by case, I suppose. I mean, do a, a clearer example maybe is, uh, is abortion. So if the right to life is the most fundamental, attack on innocent human life is the most outrageous uh, moral problem, then the church, you know, I think properly recognizes that as so fundamental. The church also would see, for example, masturbation is morally problematic. We're not going to legislate against masturbation. So there's the acquaintance principle. If something is so fundamental to the uh, right ordering of society that um, legislating against it is called for, then by all means. If it would cause a problem so enormous on the other side, well then prudence dictates that you shouldn't legislate against it. Um, so that's always the principle that has to be applied in all these cases. Yeah, so let's actually go with all three of those because I think they're, they're all hot button ones. Yeah. People will want your, your feelings on each one. So in the case of, of abortion, you're saying it's at such a high level basically because you're dealing with human life that this is something that should be illegal. So, so the argument is that at the moment of conception, that's where life begins. Mm -hmm. Well, we could amplify that in different ways too. You know. Yeah. But, but that is the argument. That, so you yeah, believe that, if that we the start, moment of conception. If we start disrespecting human life in that fundamental way, the very moral foundation of the society collapse, and that will manifest itself in all sorts of ways. So I think we've recognized that pr quite properly as so fundamental that we have to uh, legislate against it, or it's wise for the society for that to be prescribed legally. Yeah, so what do you do in all the murky cases that everyone talks about? So a 16-year-old girl is raped violently, does not want to have the child, it's three days after the event. Do, do you see some distinction there? Yeah, there, certainly, A, at the psychological level, of course, we'd recognize the, the difference there. When you come, though, to the moral issue, you know, why would the child have to be the victim of that, uh, the further victim of that situation? Why would the child have to be, as it were, eliminated to solve that problem? Um, murky, yes. Problematic, yes. Psychologically, uh, uh, difficult, of course, but the moral issue remains the same. Uh, that child has no less dignity than someone conceived another way. So the church would still make that uh, strong statement that yeah. that child should be respected. Is there an instance where science could change the church's teachings? In other words, if, if there was flat out science that could be handed to you that said, well actually, although the egg meets the sperm at day one, but actually what we believe now and what we can factually prove now is life doesn't begin for two months, that the first two months are the primordial stew, but there's not the essence of life. If that could be proven to you, could that change your position on this? Well, but it'd be hard to imagine science unsaying what it said about human DNA at that level. And so if that's present, I think it's hard to avoid the inclusion we're dealing with human life. Um, questions of consciousness and all that is personhood tied to consciousness. I think are much more derivative. The fundamental fact is you're dealing with, at the biological level, at the most fundamental way, human life. So I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine science gainsaying that. In some ways, I would argue we're staying with the science. I mean, we're, we're staying with something that Thomas Aquinas wouldn't have seen, for example. Thomas would have seen ensoulment happening later. We press it now because of science in a more radical direction. Yeah, do you ever think that some of these can be just a net loss for the church, even if, even if you're taking what you believe to be the moral and correct position, that if X amount of people, and this will also, can also transition us to gay marriage, but if 60% of the country says, or 60% of your own congregation says, well, I'm actually for, uh, I'm, I'm pro-choice, or mm -hmm. I'm for gay marriage, that you are ultimately, you're playing a losing game even with your own people, even if your, your moral position you feel is completely Tenable. Yeah, but we can't play it that way because then you're doing evil that good might come of it. If you say, well, we'll do this because we'll get more people. Think of Jesus in the Gospel of John announcing the doctrine of the real presence. What he said, you know, my, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. They all left. Everyone left except his disciples. And he goes, well, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, well, no, you've got the words of everlasting life. In other words, they weren't playing a numbers game. They weren't saying, oh, we better, better back off that teaching because the people are going to go. I'll give you, you know, whenever we get to sexual things, I like to 
to at least make a comparison to another moral area. The church has got a very strong teaching about just war, the just war theory, you know. There are certain criteria have to be met to justify going to war, then other criteria have to be met to justify how we conduct the war, right? My judgment, if you really apply those teachings, there's never been a just war. Even World War II, you might say, sure, going to war it could be justified, but Dresden, the fire bombings of Frankfurt and Tokyo, the atomic bombs, those are radically immoral for, on Catholic grounds because we call for discrimination between combatants and non-combatants. Mm -hmm. We so, call, so those are tactical things. Well, yeah, the war itself, you would say, is just. The let's allies, say in the case of World War II, yeah. I'll maybe grant you that going to war, yeah. you could justify it. The conduct of the war, absolutely not. Now, my point is, if you had polled Catholics, let's say, in 1945, were we justified in dropping the atomic bombs? 98%, I bet, would have said, yeah. Poll Catholics today. Mm -hmm. Say, were we justified in dropping atomic bombs? Firebombing Dresden. I bet 97% would say yes okay, we better dial down our teaching then. We better mm -hmm. dial down that just war teaching and say, and if you brought a lot of generals into the room, I bet they'd say, you know, Father, that's great, but you priests are naive about this. You don't know how war is conducted. And this is totally idealistic, unrealistic. Should we therefore dial down the just war teaching? No, because we're calling people to a radical sanctity. It's a high bar on purpose. We don't dial down the ideals because people, A, find them difficult or they'll walk away because of them. Um, and I think now apply it back to sexual matters. It's a similar situation. The church is extreme in its demand. And now I'm going to play the Pope Francis card, and not cynically, because the, the church plays both cards. It's extreme in its demand because it wants its people to be saints, not mediocrities. Extreme in its demand. At the same time, it's extreme in its mercy. So, a mass murderer comes to the confessional and he says, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've, I've murdered 25 people. Uh, are you contrite? Yes, I, I, I'm contrite about it. Uh, do you resolve never to do that again? Yes. The proper response to the priest is, I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, the church offers a radical mercy that is the balance, if you want, to the radical demand. That's one way of getting at some of the hard case stuff. Yeah, so I, I want to get to a couple of other things. But in that specific case, so someone comes in, yeah. I've murdered 25 people, uh, you know, I absolve you of that. Is the, is the where's the legal onus? Now? Oh, and th that's a whole different question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you as a confessor, would let's say the guy has not uh, surrendered to the police. Right. Of course, surrender to the police, of course, and now... Uh, go to jail for the rest of your life. But I mean, does the priest have a legal, I guess the priest does have a legal response. There's nothing within well, the church that would, or is there something no, within the church? Would that you can't break the seal of confession, but you could. You should indeed say to the person, let's say they have not, of course, surrender right. the police, of course, take all the justice coming to you from the law. But the point there is from the church's perspective, the forgiveness of God is offered in this lavish way. And the church's mercy toward all of us, and see, I, I, here's where, you never want to be up on the pedestal like all oh, you people need to get in line. I'm the worst sinner. I, I mean, I fall short of the church's teaching all the time. And so uh, we're, we're reliant upon the divine mercy at every minute, even as we call ourselves and others to a kind of heroic uh, virtue. Yeah. yeah, is there some slippery slope there? Like if someone went into a therapist, you know, yeah. a psychologist, and said, I murdered 25 people, and they said, well, do you feel bad? Do you repent and all that stuff? And the guy said, yeah. I'm pretty sure that legally the therapist would have to go to the authorities, like if they were threatening to kill themselves. Right, but that's not. I think the, so. I understand yeah. that it's not the same as the church, right. but in a weird way, is the church is getting a real bonus, a, a real governmental bonus there, in a way, right? Someone can come in for absolution, yeah. get it, and now the person who now has this information doesn't have to do anything with it. That that seems well, like a, a bit of a boondog well, I to wouldn't, me. No, but I wouldn't phrase it that way. I mean, he can't do something with it because the way a confession is understood by the church. And the state right, has at least saying, for the a, moment a, respected a, that, you know. Right. So, but that's what I'm saying. So the the church is getting a little bonus there that a secular, uh, I, s I suppose, a therapist wouldn't get. Right. But the churchman in question would still be obliged, of course, to tell that person to uh, to surrender and to accept legal justice and all its ramifications. So it's not like a get out of jail free card confession. It's a it's a promise of the divine mercy that comes to you in a lavish way. Now, having said that, should you go to jail for the rest of your life? Yeah, yeah, probably.
<laughs> right. Know? And that's a different, uh, different adjudication. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move to the other two examples that you mentioned. So gay marriage. Yeah. So I don't know how much Googling you did on me before <laughs> you got here, but I am gay married. You are yeah. in my house right now. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you this yeah. entire time. Actually, when I was doing research on you, I got to the you know, gay marriage portion. I stopped reading because I don't know your full opinion and I did not want to know before we sat down. So now I, I welcome you to, yeah. to tell me that. And, and whatever you say, I will continue this conversation yeah, in, no. in the spirit which I've done it so far. Right, and I'd say several things. Um, I said this one time, I was in New York with Cardinal Dolan actually, and we were talking to reporters. And I said, if the only thing a gay person hears from the Catholic Church is, you're intrinsically disordered. We got a very serious problem on our hands. If that's what the message has become, the message of the church to a gay person should be, you are a beloved child of God who's been embraced by the mercy of Jesus Christ and invited to a full share in the divine life. You're, you're a, a, a son of God called to eternal life. There's message one. Now, within that, are there further specifications to be made about anyone's moral life? I mean, my moral life needs a lot of work, trust me, you know? <laughs> And I need to hear a lot of challenge from the church. But we'll, we'll do confession at the yeah, end. Afterwards, the yeah, yeah, afterwards no we'll have a good conversation about that. Yeah. No, but the first thing that a gay person, like any person, should hear is, you're a beloved child of God. Um, and so I, I agree with those, and Pope Francis has been good on this, that have said, if that's the way our message was coming out, we were disordered. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We had a problem there in the way that message was being uh, conveyed. Um, what's the church's take? that sexuality has a, um, has a structure, an intelligibility, that's built into it, if you will, by God, and is discernible within our physical, psychological, and spiritual makeup. It's got a proper end and purpose. The church would say it's for uh, intimacy and for procreation. Therefore, that's the fully integrated, properly uh, expressed form of sexuality. When we fall short of that, I say we on purpose. I mean, we all in different ways, I think, fall short of that ideal, including married people. Uh, the church says no to that. In a certain way, I, I don't wait, want to wait, I'm press sorry. The, the it. The church says no to what? Says when no you... to whatever that uh, imperfection is, whatever that failure fully to integrate so, okay. the meaning of sexuality. You see, in a certain way, I wouldn't want to press it further than that. That's the church's job, is to say no to what it perceives to be an inadequate, incomplete integration of the sexual uh, act. So, not just gay marriage, but now go across the board. Anything that falls short of that ideal, the church would, would say no to. Why? Because it's down on people, it's puritanical, it hates sex. No, it's keeping its bar high and calling people always to that bar. As we all fall short of it, the church offers at its best the lavish mercy of God. I mean, so that's sort of the context I try to set for that conversation. Right. So, so I understand the church's bar on this. Yeah. That's that's. Uh, I'm not part of the church. It's it's fine yeah. for the church to have that bar. I have no problem with that. Um, so, your personal feelings on this matter. So, gay marriage was passed. What is it? A year and a half ago or so. Yeah. Almost two years now. Um, did you? I assume you felt it was the wrong decision by the court. Is that, is that fair to say? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, no, I, I do, but I don't think I would want to press it much further. I think where we are right now in the States, I'll apply the Aquinas principle. I think it would probably cause much more uh, problem and dissension and difficulty if we kept pressing it. So, so then do you not see gay marriage as one of the ones that you said was so pressing earlier when you said that abortion would be one that is so pressing yeah. that it could shift, it could alter the course of a country or something? I, do you not see gay marriage at that level of severity? No, I, I do think it does have a negative impact on the wider society. I do think it is a, in a certain way, a compromising or undermining of an institution that's key to the uh, health of a society. Um, can, can you explain that a little further? Like, if, how so? Just as the uh, dignity of the individual is fundamental morally, so I think marriage, we've classically seen as the great building block of the wider society. So all the different forms of social life are grounded finally in that fundamental form of social life. So marriage open to children is that form. And society, I think, takes that as one of its foundational elements. Um, so I do think there's a compromising if we um, 
if we forget the integrity of that, uh, that foundation. Yeah, is this one of the things where I sense that your heart and your, uh, your spiritual sense self maybe aren't quite matched up? Because I, I, I don't sense judgment from you sitting yeah. here. I really don't. Yeah. Um, and I don't sense that you want, that you would try to legislate to reverse the decision, but I also sense that you can't fully say to me, well, it's, it's okay. Yeah, no, and that's probably right. The way you just put it there is probably right. I, I wouldn't want to fully just say, that's great, off you go. Yeah. At the same time, I wouldn't want to get onto a, you know, a crusader's tank and try to you know, reverse that. And I certainly don't want gay people to have the impression that the church is you know, in some kind of special warfare against them. It's not. The church is, at its best, is reaching out in love and reaching out with the offer of the divine life. That's what matters. So I feel strongly about that, you know? Yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll do the one other that you mentioned out of these three, and then we'll yeah. move on to some other stuff. Oh, so, you, so you mentioned porn. Um, I have watched porn, obviously. I think probably everyone has watched porn. I think almost everyone that's watched porn would probably say they've watched too much porn. Um, but what's your basic take on Again, it's a it's a legal act. So again, we're we're in that place of yeah. that something can be legal and maybe frowned upon by the church. Uh, how, how do you frame that whole? Well, I think actually case? I mentioned about masturbation, not, not yeah. porn, but because uh, oh, masturbation would be yeah. a good example. Of, I guess those things are connected. At some yeah, point. Connected, <laughs> but let's say so. In the church's teaching, indeed, masturbation is seen as an inadequate, incomplete expression of human sexuality. Do I recommend, therefore, let's legislate against it and send the police after people? No, because obviously there'd be such a huge social uh, uh, negative impact from that that the Aquinas principle would clearly hold. Now, porn, I suppose we could have an argument about that. Uh, I've been impressed by some of these recent studies, not from a religious moral perspective, but from more of a medical, psychological perspective, on the deleterious effects of porn on, on this coming generation. You know, guys that have grown up with pornography in a way that my generation didn't, uh, but young people today, starting usually at 11 or 12, mm -hmm. studies show, and the effects it's having on them now as they, as they try to begin their you know, sexual lives has been problematic. You know? The objectification of people involved, I can certainly raise that as a moral issue. Violence and porn, I could raise as a moral issue. So I don't think that's just free of you know, all moral concern. And I think there are medical, psychological issues attached to it as well that are problematic. Now, do you press that in a, in a legal direction? So I might leave that to the lawyers and the, you know, the politicians. Yeah. So where is that space where how much influence actually should, if we come from a Judeo-Christian <clears throat> foundation here in America, which I think even people that don't like that we do would, yeah. would agree that we do, yeah. uh, how much room should there be for the church or the temple or the mosque or whatever it else to actually influence policy? Because I know most, my secular belief would be, I would say virtually none, especially if these organizations want to remain tax exempt. So for example, when the Mormon church was putting so much money into fighting gay marriage, to me they're taking a political position very publicly, using money to do it and at the same time, claiming for tax exemption. That's something that I cannot reconcile and I've never mm. heard a good argument against that. But for you, how much do you feel the church can be involved while also at the same time claim, you know, getting tax exempt status, which is pretty sweet? Yeah, the tax exempt question, I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about that. But generally speaking, I would say the church, again, not imposing but proposing within the public space can and should be a voice. And not aggressively so, not using the arm of the state. We, we don't have that. Um, but arguing, making a case publicly. I, I, in some ways, my model would be, take Lincoln's second inaugural, take King's speech in, 18, in 1963. Both were um, people using religious arguments, but in a public sphere. They weren't sermons, but they were deeply biblical. And they were coming up out of a moral tradition that was, that was biblical in form. And they used that to make a case for political change. Uh, I think that should be allowed. See, I'm against a liberalism that's become aggressive toward religion and it wants to exclude it from the public space. Um, I have no quarrel with liberalism in its classical form. I, I'm opposed to an aggressive secularism that doesn't want religion to be a voice in the public forum. I think it can and should be, and I'll take King and Lincoln as my examples. The tax exemption thing, I haven't thought enough about the tax exemption thing to, to really press it with you, but um, I, I'd want us to be a voice. I don't think that's asking too much. Yeah, 
I certainly think that's fair. I would say every individual, I talk about individualism yeah. all the time on the show, and I think every individual has the right to And, and to furthermore, that our arguments don't have to be couched in explicitly kind of rationalistic terms. Um, Lincoln wasn't making a purely rationalistic argument. He was relying on the Bible and appealing to people that knew the Bible well. And I think that should be okay in the public space. King was too, making a public argument for a political change, but he was relying on people's deep knowledge of the moral teaching of the Bible to do so. And I hope that's always possible in the American space. And I worry a little bit that an aggressive liberalism is going to exclude that. Yeah, so that's actually a great uh, segue to my next question. Have Christians lost something in that battle? Mm -hmm. The battle where very obviously you can make fun of Christians relentlessly. Yeah. It's extremely easy. You can mm -hmm. turn on some of my favorite shows, and we'll talk about The Simpsons in a second, yeah. but they can mock Christianity all the time. Family Guy can mock Christianity. Yeah. South Park can mock Christianity. You can mock Mormonism all the time. Um, if you mock Islam, mm -hmm. this is a whole other situation. Yeah. So in a weird way, they've taken Christians' tolerance mm -hmm. and used it against them. Yeah. Um, how do you... Is, is this something, did, did Christianity screw up in a weird, I normally don't no, think of Christianity and tolerance in the same thing, yet at the same time I understand that I live in this society that's predominantly Christian and is probably the most tolerant society ever. Yes, on earth. and that's not accidental because at its best, toleration comes from deeply uh, biblical sources, I would say. And again, the, the stance of love, of uh, the dignity of the individual, a deep suspicion of government, I mean, that's right through the Bible. I love that. In the American system, I think it's deeply biblical that we're suspicious of our leaders. We want to check them at every uh, turn. Um, read uh, 1 Samuel sometime if you have doubts about that. Uh, Israel's approach to kings, you know. So I, I think that's right, that, that a lot of the best of the uh, tradition of tolerance comes out of Christianity. Here's another side to it. Uh, at the heart of our faith, imagistically speaking, is a man uh, crucified. And not just crucified, but stripped naked and exposed to ridicule. So Jesus would have been placed on this hill near the gate of Jerusalem. And the purpose was to mock him. Uh, Queen Circe in uh, Game of Thrones comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. That was part of what crucifixion meant, that you were humiliating someone publicly as they were spitting at him and they were mocking him. That's what we hold up. We don't hide that. We hold it up. Jesus crucified. Paul says, I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified. And so in a certain way, there's the ground for it that, all right, you know, yeah, throw garbage at us. Well, our, our guy, <laughs> our Messiah, our leader, that's how we show him. And so there's, there's a mystery there of God's willingness to endure a human sin and willingness to take upon himself negativity. And see, at their best, the kings and people like that, they got that. Mm -hmm. That has enormous power for social change. And so there's a distinction between Christianity and Islam, mm -hmm. where there's you know, massive outrage if the Prophet Muhammad is, is displayed in a mocking way. Mm -hmm. We hold them up. Right. We hold up the mocked, humiliated, crucified Jesus. And I do think your instinct is right, that a, a lot of what's best in our tradition of tolerance comes from that. So how much, is, how much is humor a part of this? And now we can also shift to, to The Simpsons a little bit. Okay. But I think, you know, how much of, of Judaism is based in humor? You can yeah. turn on any, I mean, the gajillion Jewish comics, yeah, right. whatever, everyone's, there's so much, it's about humor. So you can make fun of religion through the lens of humor. Yes. Watch it, you, of, of not only religion, but of historic, horrifically horrible historical things that happen yeah. in the Holocaust and all that, and Mel Brooks and yes. Larry David and Seinfeld, and right. et cetera, et cetera. Christianity has made it clear that if you're going to mock Jesus on television and movies, that it's basically okay. In a weird way, are the secularists doing something dangerous with Islam? When they say, we're going to never talk about this, never joke about this, never whatever, aren't they actually emboldening the pieces that are the, the more radical elements? Yeah, maybe. I'm getting maybe. into murky waters Yeah, because I, I, I can't really speak for Islam. You know, maybe that's true. But I like the instinct behind your question, I think, is, is right. Uh, whenever I hear like a Mel Brooks or a Larry David, those people, I always think the biblical prophets. I always think, oh, those people that wrote the Bible, you know, and the style of humor, and that kind of edgy, uh, ironic, uh, a little bit world weary, uh, nothing's going to work out. I mean, now read the prophet Jeremiah. Now read the book of Job. Now read the prophet Jonah. And Larry David could have written that book, you know, or Mel Brooks. <laughs> so I, I like that. I, yeah. I love that. I think that is true. It's part of a biblical perspective. 
A lot of it comes to from a keen sense of imperfectibility. That's a biblical idea. Look at a lot of classical philosophy, and here it has something in common with modern philosophy. Both believe in human perfectibility. So Aristotle and Plato, you know, just, you know, learn the forms and study enough and be rightly right, educated, escape from the cave, and you'll be fine, right? Modern forms of it, Marxism and so on and so forth, just we make these requisite economic changes, political adjustments, and we'll have the utopia. Religious people coming up out of the Bible, we are always suspicious of that. <laughs> we are all from the left or the right. We don't like utopianism. We think that is a highly problematic and will lead to the piling up of corpses, which indeed it has, right? Uh, Pascal's, what's his great line? Uh, the one who would make himself an angel makes himself a beast. You know, that whenever you think, oh, if I just make these adjustments, we'll be fine. Biblical people are like, yeah, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> but I mean, in a good Larry David kind of way, like, hey, and even including liberal democracy. Great, I like liberal democracy, you know, best of all, or worst of all governments have all the other ones, right? right. Sure, I, but I like it. I like liberal democracy. But don't tell me liberal democracy is going to usher in the eschaton. It's not. And it's got all kinds of problems. Uh, Nazism, <laughs> communism, Marxism, everything. Uh, the Bible is suspicious of all those isms. And I think that's a great thing. Um, even, you know, Jesus on the cross again, wearing this crown of thorns, with a sign over his head that was put there by the Roman governor. Talk about, you know, the Roman Empire, boy, we're going to solve this problem. Just submit to us, you'll be fine. And it's a mockery. The cross is meant to be, it's, it's held up as a mockery to the world. Um, and that Pilate deliciously put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, thereby undermining himself, <laughs> you know. So I love that side of, of biblical religion. Uh, we're, we're like Larry David. We're skeptical of, of a lot of... Uh, societal forms, you know. Hmm. So from Larry David now finally to The Simpsons. No, so Simpsons. you've talked about the Homer yeah. Simpsonization effect. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. And I love this because you, your, your basic argument is that Homer came around and he was sort of this kind of dullard, trying to do well but incompetent, and his wife, Marge, was the stickler and the whatever. And I, I used to talk about this in stand-up, that this sort of, this idea eventually ruined comedy. I love The Simpsons. So much of what I believe <laughs> and, and satire came from The Simpsons, yeah. especially those early years. But then there yeah. was this like cloning of shows yeah. where every male character was this, this right. inept moron who didn't know what was going on. And the, the woman was secretly pulling the strings or telling the guy he was an idiot or something. Yeah. What, what's the net effect? What is it about this that bothers you? Yeah, and of course, I agree with you too. I love The Simpsons. I've watched them for years. And I can quote Simpsons lines. It links me to a lot of people. Uh, I love The Simpsons. It's the best written show on television, all that. Yeah. Uh, and what great I, satire related to oh, religion, yeah, wonderful. right? Yes. And all religion. Watch when God appears in The Simpsons. It's always, it's always interesting when God appears in mm -hmm. The Simpsons. And also, unlike almost every other show in America, everyone goes to church on Sunday in The Simpsons. The whole, <laughs> the whole town. Mr. Yeah. Burns, they're all in church on Sunday, yeah. you know. Except um, for Krusty and Apu, I think. They're, they're, they're going Krusty somewhere else. But Kr I love when... But uh, there's a lot of rabbis. Jackie stuff. Mason played yeah. Krusty's father, the yeah. rabbi, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're great on religion. God has... God has the five fingers. The other one's all right. like... You know. Right, right. Uh, remember the one where God is, is like a beam of light and he's chasing Homer yeah. in a car <laughs> and then it jumps a, a train track and the train's going by and then God goes... I'm too old and rich for this. <laughs> you know, no, God always comes, comes across pretty well in The Simpsons. Yeah. But what was bugging me, and what you're referring to, is this um, almost demonization of, of men. You know, that men are, um, as you say, it's bumblers and, and incompetent, and it's the women that have all the gifts. And remember the episode when Lisa is so worried that, that she's inherited some terrible thing from her family, but in fact, the stupid gene is on the male side, and you know, the female Simpsons are all... Brain They're surgeons all and all that. And, yeah. Okay, my fear is that, and then I extrapolate from that to a lot of things in the popular culture where you see the same dynamic. Uh, I worry about young men in our culture that uh, imbibe that message of kind of inferiority, and uh, um, I want to say, you know, you go boy as much as you go girl, and, and give the boys a sense of, of their purpose. It doesn't have to stand to thwart women, doesn't have to be in an oppressive relationship, but I want men to feel as, you know, empowered and all that. And I do worry a little bit about younger men, and you see it in the, um, in the literature of the psychologists. We'll talk about, as they deal with young men, this sense of, uh, of inferiority. So that's what I was complaining about there, but generally, I, I love The Simpsons. Yeah. I feel like The Simpsons is the right way to end this.
Yeah, do you, good. Do you, do you accept that <laughs> as do. the as I, the proper ending? We, well, I thoroughly enjoy this, and and, good, and then, I think thanks. this was really what the spirit of what I tried, the spirit good. unintended of what I try <laughs> to do here. I think we did pretty well, and uh, I loved it. And that's what it's all about. So I, we'll do it again sometime because I'd love that. I, I, there's a lot more I didn't get to here. <laughs> I'd love that. All right. Well, I want to thank Bishop Barron for joining me today, and you can follow him on the Twitter at Bishop Barron and check out his website, WordOnFire.org.